Good morning. Welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church. My name is Robert Gorell and I'm the senior minister. It's my joy to share with you some announcements today. We begin a new Sunday school class this morning and uh, I'll be teaching that for the summer. We'll be using Maxie Dunham's wonderful study, Coping as Christians. This is a great study. Every church I've used it in has loved it. It's about how we deal with just all those daily problems that come up like interruptions and uh, broken relationships and how our faith helps us deal with those uh, all those kinds of challenges we face. That's Sunday mornings in room 102 during the Sunday school hour. Come and join us for Children's Logos this June. We're doing that every Wednesday night at 4.30. Last week we were talking about how God uh, makes a home for all creation and we made birdhouses. We're having lots of fun, great snacks, good times. Wednesday nights at 4.30. Call the church for more information. The youth group has a cookout June 12th, and uh, that's always a lot of fun. It'll be out at the Birds uh, Ranch, and we invite you to come and be a part of it. Check the church newsletter for more information. Vacation Bible School begins June 13th, and we have every night a wonderful uh, ministry plan for our children, and we hope that you'll sign up, contact the church office, to sign up and you can sign up online. And then finally, our Youth Lead for Camp, Youth Force, June 19th. A lot of great things happening. What a wonderful and busy time at our church and what a great day for worship. Thank you for joining us at Centenary. Come Holy Spirit and fill this place. Make your presence known to us, move, in us and around us, fill us with your breath that we might worship you with our whole hearts this day. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Good morning, Refuge. Let us worship our God together on this beautiful Sunday. Put your hands together. Help us out. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for the stream. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. There you want to find me. That's what my father does. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the father's house, check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. I was not the laying the church is where you are. You never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story is to know if the story isn't good now, failure's never final in the flowers. I said, failure's never final when the father's in the room. Whoa, lay your burdens down. Whoa, here in the father's house, check your shame at the door. Prodigals are coming home. Prodigals come home. The helpless find home. Love is on the move when the father's in the room. 
Stars and girls from the blood The dead come to life Love is on the move When the Father's in the Miracles take place The cynical fight fade Love is breaking through When the Father's in the room Jericho walls are quaking Strongholds now are shaking Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Whoa. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to the refuge at St. Mary United Methodist Church. Do not adjust your television sets. We are red today. It is the day of Pentecost, the day where we celebrate the arrival of the Holy Spirit to the disciples who were waiting, gathered in Jerusalem. On this day, we pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our own lives, that we might be transformed to be more like Christ, and to share the message in the world around us. We're continuing our series today on overcoming giants. We'll be talking about the giant that can be within. Giants like guilt or shame or even defensiveness and how Peter overcame that giant on the day of Pentecost when he's able to deliver a message of hope and forgiveness to the crowd that had gathered there. During our next song, we will be collecting our offering as a way of responding to the work that the Holy Spirit is doing, that we might be in ministry in the community around us. So if you would like to give online, you can give at lawntonsentinary.org or give during this offering time. But before our next song, will you join me in our call to worship? <coughs> Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness is bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, 
Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes of new. As we wait for the crown, tell the world that this treasure you found. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the many blessings that you pour out upon us, and we turn some of those back to you now. May they be used for the building of your kingdom in this place and around the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. Yeah, I see it now, I'm laying it down, and I know that I need you. I run to the Father, I fall into grace, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, 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 oh. You saw my condition, had a plan. Your son for redemption, the price for my heart. And I don't have a context for that kind of love. I don't understand, I can't comprehend all I know is. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs. here in this place, like the disciples who gathered on that Pentecost day, waiting to hear from you. We reach, reach out our hands and our hearts to receive your Holy Spirit, 
that will be poured out upon us. And whether it comes in great wind or fire or quiet whispers on our hearts, open our eyes and our ears to receive it. Pour out your spirit upon this community that where there is hunger, all might be fed, or those who go without shelter will find refuge, or those who are isolated will find community. Pour out your spirit upon your church that we might declare your good news to the world around us. Pour out your spirit upon our leaders here in this place, in this state, in this nation, and across the world, that they would lead with your wisdom and compassion. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon our world in every place of violence. Pour out your spirit of peace. We pray especially for peace as we deal again with yet another shooting now in Tulsa. We pray for the victims and their families. We pray that our, our words and our prayers would be transformed into actions that bring healing and safety. That those who are tormented by isolation and anger and frustration would find your peace. We would find support around them in the communities and a love that comes from you. We pray for those who are dealing with injury and illnesses and ask that your spirit of healing would be upon them, that you would restore them to wholeness, that you would give strength to the people who give them care. Whatever other places there are in our lives, that are dry or weary, that cry out for new life, breathe your spirit into us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture today comes from Acts 2, 37 through 42. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Spirit of the living God, Fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Amen. Peter offered to the crowd a simple invitation. Repent and be baptized so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a simple invitation to come and repent, to be baptized, to receive forgiveness. But it's really extraordinary when you think about and you reflect on the sermon that led up to that invitation. Because the sermon that, that Peter gives, this is his Pentecost Day sermon. The apostles have been gathered together and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit descended upon them in a great wind and, and tongues of flame rested on their heads. You know this story of, of Pentecost that we share each and every year. But we often don't get into the, the sermon 
that Peter preached or what happened afterwards. Peter begins to preach by saying that this is the day that Joel had promised us, the prophet Joel, when the Holy Spirit would be poured out on all people, on all flesh, young and old, men and women, they would receive the gift of the Spirit and begin to prophesy and dream dreams and have visions of what God is doing in the world. And on that day, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is that day, Peter promises the crowd, that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, empowered by the Spirit, he shares this vision, this vision that God has for the people. He tells them the story of Jesus. How Jesus came as the Son of God, anointed to be the Messiah. But then he tells the crowd, and you crucified him. He basically ends his sermon and summarizes it this way. Let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Peter is preaching to a group of Jewish people gathered from all over the world for the Jewish festival of Pentecost. That's one of the amazing things about this story is people from all over the world are hearing the message from God in their own language that is a part of the gift of the Holy Spirit. So all of these Jewish people are gathered from all over the world and Peter is preaching to them. And unfortunately... This scripture has been used in anti-Semitic ways. It's a bad interpretation to say that Peter is chastising everybody for being Jewish and you should repent of your Jewishness because you Jews killed Jesus. That's not what Peter is saying at all. What Peter is telling this crowd here gathered in Jerusalem, you were complicit in the death of Jesus. Peter understands that complicity probably better than anybody in the crowd because he was there. He was by Jesus' side when Jesus was arrested. But as Jesus is standing trial, Peter faces a trial of his own. He's outside standing by a fire and the crowd gathered there and, and one person asks him, you were with this Jesus, weren't you? You know him. And Peter denies knowing Jesus. Three times Peter is asked, were you with him? Do you know him? Are you one of his? And three times Peter says, no, I don't know him. Three times Peter denies Jesus in his hour of trial. In this way, Peter himself is complicit in the death of Jesus. He had turned away from the Son of God just as the crowd had turned away from the Son of God. But after the resurrection, Jesus comes to Peter and offers him forgiveness. Three times Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And Peter gets to say three times, Jesus, you know I love you. And just as he had denied Jesus three times, now he gets to tell Jesus, I love you three times. It's Jesus' way of forgiving Peter, of hitting reset, of offering forgiveness and repentance. That Peter had denied Jesus, but he's turned back to Jesus. He's repented and returned. When Peter tells the story of Jesus to the gathered crowd and says, you crucified Jesus. The Holy Spirit is at work convicting them, making them feel strong and powerful emotions as they hear Peter preaching. It says that they were cut to the heart. It hit them close to home. And in this moment of, of guilt that they were feeling, in this moment of conviction, they, they cry out, what should we do? And I suppose Peter could have told them to take a walk. 
this is your fault. He could have blamed them. He could have been angry. But instead, knowing the power of forgiveness in his own life, knowing the power of an invitation to repent, to return, to become again a part of the story of Jesus, Peter extends that same invitation to the crowd gathered at Pentecost. Repent and be baptized, and your sins will be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. A simple invitation but a powerful one, because 3,000 people that day respond to it. On this day of Pentecost, Peter overcomes the giant of self-guilt and self-doubt and shame. I think about the feelings that he must have felt between the crucifixion and all the way through the resurrection as he's still thinking about his denial of Jesus all the way through his forgiveness. I denied Jesus. My love failed. I turned away from God. How could God want me back? How could I be a part of this story of God's salvation? Jesus forgave him before he ascended into heaven, but this is the first time we really get to hear from Peter since then. And I want to let you in on a secret. When preachers preach, we're often preaching to ourselves about things that we are dealing with, about feelings that we are having. And so I think as Peter stood there, extending the forgiveness to the crowd, he was talking to himself as well, reminding himself of the forgiveness that he had experienced, of the guilt that he felt, how it had cut him to the heart. But he invites the crowd to be a part again of the story of salvation. And as he extends that invitation, the Holy Spirit moves. And the people respond to this invitation. I can just imagine as the crowds are coming forward, repenting, asking for forgiveness, being baptized, receiving the Holy Spirit, how powerful that scene must be have been, the weight that must have been lifted off of Peter's shoulders. Because he knows the freedom that each of these people who are coming forward is experiencing because he has experienced it for himself. And this moment confirms for him that he has overcome this giant. That God has welcomed him back and that God is using him again. But this giant of self-guilt and of shame, it is no small giant. It was a major victory that day for Peter and for the Holy Spirit to overcome it. Because these giants that we carry internally, the giants of our own making, they can stay with us for years. They can gnaw at us. They can nag at us. They can weigh us down. They can feel like a weight holding us back. And if not addressed, they will stay with us for years and years. To this day, I still feel a, a punch of guilt in my stomach when I think about something I did over 10 years ago. I said a word to describe something that I thought was silly or dumb, which was not an appropriate word to use ever, especially when we were volunteering at the Youth Special Olympics in Stillwater. To this day, I feel embarrassed and ashamed that I would use a word that would be hurtful to many of the people we were there to help and to enjoy the day with. It fills me with with guilt and pain and embarrassment, a pit in my stomach. But before that day, it was a word that I would use too often. I even used it on a social media post, and a friend called me out on it. 
And when my friend called me out on using this word on a, on a post, I got defensive. But I can say what I want to. It's just a word. Leave me alone. I'm not going to change it. I'm not going to do anything differently. I put my guard up. That's the other thing that can happen when we are convicted, when the Holy Spirit moves, when we are told or reminded that we've done something wrong, we get defensive and we put up this giant of defense to try to fight our battles for us. But it was on that, that day in Stillwater that I was cut to the heart and realized the error of my ways and have thus repented and don't use that slur anymore. When we're convicted of doing something, when we feel that, that nudge in us, our consciousness, which is a work of the Holy Spirit, or when a friend calls us out for something that we've done wrong, we have options. We can be defensive, we can put up our guard, we can defend what we've done. Or other times we can become so overwhelmed with guilt and hopelessness that we're no good to do anything. Both of these are giants that can keep us from moving forward, that keep us from living out lives that God wants us to live, that can hold us back from participating in God's story of salvation. These giants of guilt and of defensiveness. But healing comes when we recognize what we've done wrong, when we have that feeling that cuts us to the heart, but we don't stay there. Instead, we hear the invitation of Peter, the invitation of the Holy Spirit to repent, to receive forgiveness, to turn back towards God, back down the path that God is calling us to live. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is that consciousness that lets us know when we have done something wrong, that helps us understand even right from wrong. Peter heard a rooster crow the third time he denied Jesus, and instantly he felt he had done something wrong and knew what he had done wrong. When the crowd gathered on Pentecost and they heard this sermon from Peter, the Spirit worked in them, and instantly they knew what they had done wrong. When we have those moments in our lives, that is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's when we should not become defensive or be weighed down by guilt, but instead ask for forgiveness. That is exactly what we do when we come to this communion table. We hear the invitation to come. We hear Jesus ask us to eat with him. And sometimes when we hear that invitation, we think of all the baggage that we bring with us or all the reasons we think Jesus wouldn't want us to be there. First of all, there is nothing that would prevent Jesus from inviting you to the table. But second of all, we have an opportunity to lay those things down when we share in a confession before we come to the table. We confess so that we can leave those things behind, so we can turn them back to God and receive the forgiveness that God is offering to us. And then as we pray together, as we gather around the table, We watch as the Holy Spirit comes and transforms the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Christ. And in that transformation, we too are changed and renewed and restored and made whole again. It is a sign of the grace of God at work in your lives. We are fed by this grace. It nourishes our very soul so that we can have the strength to go back out into the world and extend that invitation that we have received 
to others. At this table today, leave your giants behind. Allow the grace and forgiveness of God to defeat them, that you might be strengthened to go out in the world and proclaim this good news to others. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is inviting us to eat with him today, to share in this meal. So as we come to the table, will you join me now in this prayer of confession? God of mercy, you have called us to love with our whole hearts, but we fall short. We have disobeyed your commands and turned our backs on our neighbors in need. Forgive us, we pray, and set us free by your grace. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. As the forgiven and reconciled children of God, during this next song, we'll invite you to take your prayers to God. As we light our prayer candle, and the flame reminds us of the flame of the Holy Spirit and its power working in our lives, offering us and others forgiveness. That you'd also take this moment to share signs of the peace of Christ with one another. That you would greet one another uh, either by saying, peace of Christ be with you, or just saying good morning, so glad to be worshiping with you today. Let us continue in our worship. Spirit sound rushing with fire of God, pour within Holy Ghost, breathe on us, we pray. As we repent to turn from sin, revival in the smoldering breath of God, let us into that burn with holy fear, purify faith in deep, refine us by your strength in what remains. So we the church bear your light, lamp of flame, the city bright, king and kingdom come as one. you pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. During the prayer of the great thanksgiving, there's a portion of the prayer called the epiclesis. 
And that's where we invite the Holy Spirit to come and transform not only the bread and the wine, but us gathered here. When we get to that moment, we'll, I'll, I'll lift my hands out to, to um, us and to the bread as a sign of blessing and an invitation for the Spirit. And when we get to that time, I invite you to, to do the same thing, to lift your hands, to receive the Spirit as we bless these elements together. And I'll, I'll tell you when that time comes in the prayer. Will you join me now in the great thanksgiving? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed to us the breath of life. When our love failed and we turned away from you, your love remained steadfast. You made covenant to be our sovereign God. You spoke to us through your prophets. You led us out of the wilderness and into freedom. And so with the people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, release to the captives, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. Jesus fed the hungry, healed the sick, and ate with sinners. And by the suffering of his baptism, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and he shared it with his disciples and he said, Take, eat from this all of you. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, shared it with his disciples and said, Take, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Will you join me as we call on the Holy Spirit? Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. It is through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The bread which we break, it is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup which we bless, it is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Christ has prepared this table for you. These elements have been transformed by the Holy Spirit. 
May the Spirit transform your life as well. Come and eat with Jesus. Nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence. And I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone thank you god in your presence lord
to be overcome by your presence, Yeah. 
you have received the gift of the Holy Spirit this day, that you have been filled with the grace of God and strengthened to go out in the world and proclaim that good news. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go now in peace. Amen. Thank you.